So good morning, everyone, and welcome. I am Alana Feldman. I'm the Interim Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first event in the Technology and Diplomacy Speaker Series, which is a new forum representing an exciting partnership between General Dynamics Inf Information Technology and the George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs. The series will bring together industry, academia, and government to discuss important issues that impact transnational security. And the impetus behind this partnership is the initiation of the Elliott School's Bachelor of Science in International Affairs degree program. Building on the same core curriculum found in our Bachelor of Arts program, the Bachelor of Science in International Affairs demonstrates the university's understanding that the successful integration of STEM fields and international affairs is a critical need in preparing students for the increasingly science and technology dependent landscape of 21st century global affairs. Before I introduce the moderator for today's event, please be aware of a few housekeeping rules. One, the event today will be recorded and it will be run under Chatham House rules. So participants are free to use the information received but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant should be disclosed. And finally, please be aware that we have international participants among our audience today. So today's event will be moderated by Admiral Michelle Howard, former Shapiro Visiting Professor of International Affairs at the Elliott School and a retired United States Navy four-star admiral who last served as the commander of United States Naval Forces Europe and concurrently the commander of United States Naval Forces Africa and commander of Allied Joint Forces Command Naples. Admiral Howard, thank you very much for your participation today and I will hand it over to you to introduce the panelists. Dean Feldman, thank you so much for kicking us off. So everyone, I'm so glad you could join us and of course we all regret we can't be in person but uh, I think this is the probably the most appropriate way for us to come together and have a dialogue uh, when you think about the topic. So for me, the cyber domain is a complicated and entangled uh, sphere. And I think it's best described, I heard one pundit say, you know, God made the, the seas, the land, and but man made cyber domain, and that just about explains everything. And so we, we uh, have now become inclusive and included in this next dimension. And for all of us, I think uh, uh, the coronavirus, the COVID over the last year has only highlighted how, into, how deeply involved all of us are in this domain. And, and it doesn't matter what community you're in, academic, business corporations, governments, we are all in this domain and it has the complexity of great open spaces along with the urban feel. Everyone's in this domain. School kids, criminals, citizens, politicians, teachers, we're all in it. So today we want to talk about cybersecurity, international relations, the impact of this domain uh, and, and what we what things we can do about it and how we should be thinking about it. So I'm very fortunate. We've got uh, Dr. Matthew, Matthew McFadden from General Dynamics, Dr. Costas Torregas from George Washington, and Laura Bates, the Senior Director of the uh, Solar Solarium Report, which if you haven't read, I get online and a uh, marvelous piece of work in, in, in telling us how we should get to frameworks in this domain as a government. So I'm gonna start by having our panelists give you a little bit about themselves and then talk about their perspectives of the domain and the challenges and opportunities that uh, exist. So Dr. Matt, I'm gonna start with you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. So I'm very excited to, to talk about this topic. Um, you know, to, to start out, you know, so I represent a GDIT uh, as uh, their cyber director. Um, so if you're not familiar with GDIT, you know, we're one of the largest providers 
uh, you know, of cybersecurity within the federal government. So, um, you know, we, we operate in probably every major federal agency, uh, some of the largest SOCs. Uh, we have about 3,000 cyber professionals, um, you know, 6,800 cyber certifications. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we, we help the federal government, you know, drive their strategy forward uh, when it comes to cyber. Um, and, you know, the, the reality with cyber is it, it really doesn't have any borders. Um, there, there are challenges with workforce, you know, having the right talent to address uh, cyber needs. Um, you know, do you have the right cyber operations? Uh, and are, you know, we leveraging the right technology um, to help increase our cyber posture? So, um, as we all know, uh, as, as all of these new technologies uh, come into place, you know, these are new vulnerabilities, new threats, uh, you know, that, you know, we have to be aware about. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, more so than ever, our data is ever increasing. Um, our technology is ever changing. Uh, and, you know, we, we kind of have to be on the forefront of just, you know, understanding what those next threats are. Um, because, you know, as we all know, our adversaries are going to exploit it. So um, to, to go back to the, you know, the cyber has no borders problem, uh, you know, it, and even in the IT market in general, the, the perimeter is no longer, especially with the uh, advent of cloud. Um, a lot of these perimeters are closest to where our assets are kept. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of strategies uh, that we have to be concerned about um, when it comes to, you know, supply chain or um, workforce management or, you know, how are we addressing emerging technologies, whether it be uh, AI, 5G, Internet of Things. Um, so, and, and all of that is kind of a holistic approach. Um, so, you know, <laughs> and even from, a, you know, a, a, a nation perspective, I, I would say over the last uh, year or two, I mean, we've probably had some of the most significant, you know, strategy and policy issues. Um, so, like, for example, uh, you know, the, the, we have a U.S. cyber uh, policy, a DOD uh, strategy. Um, we, had, we just, you know, we had space policy directives on cyber. Uh, we had elevation of Cybercom and CISA. Um, so, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we understand that this is a, a global challenge um, and, you know, we all have to work together to solve this uh, cyber, uh, you know, challenge uh, domain across the board. So, so thank you. Matt, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Costas, I'd like you to talk a little bit about yourself, what, what you do, and then how you see this domain. Thanks, Michelle. And I knew I liked it for a reason. You mentioned Naples. I spent two years of my life at the NATO headquarters in Naples as, a Army, as an Air Force brat. So I knew there's something that connects the two of us. Um, uh, good morning to everyone. Um, <clears throat> um, I know that many of the audience are students. So I wanted to start by saying, you're in the right webinar uh, because we're going to talk about things in cybersecurity, which is a tremendous and exploding field. So for you, it's a great field to get to know and you hear from different perspectives why is cybersecurity important and what impact does it play on international affairs and diplomacy. And no matter what school you're in at GW or beyond GW, it doesn't matter. Cybersecurity is a broad area that can take on smart minds from any discipline. So with that as a start, I wanted to introduce myself quickly and through that, tell you a little bit about what I think in cybersecurity terms is important. Uh, first of all, I've got a .edu and a .gov email. Uh, that means that for my .edu, I'm the director of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Research Institute at the School of Engineering and Applied Science. So there I study things like the cascading uh, uh, impact of cyber attacks on different systems. So you, you attack, let's say, the trucking industry, and all of a sudden, the trucks can't move. So what does that mean? The food supply chain is broken. What does that mean? We, we go hungry, so all of a sudden, we begin to look for other ways to feed our family, and crime goes up, and so on and so on. 
So that cascading risk is a very interesting academic problem that I'm, I'm, I'm working on. The other thing I'm working on a lot is workforce development. How do we make sure that we have enough young men and women and career changers to enter the cybersecurity field? So I've got ex expertise in apprenticeship programs, working with NIST NICE, working with the Department of Labor. NIST NICE is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, a National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, lots of acronyms in the cybersecurity realm. Uh, and then finally, we run uh, scholarship programs. In fact, we've just opened the gates in a, my institute for a new series of scholarships in cybersecurity for anyone that's interested in having a full boat ride at GW. So that's an unabashed plug for those of you who are listening who would like to consider a scholarship to get yourself ready for government jobs, uh, take a look. Uh, my .gov uh, uh, acronym uh, comes from work that I do for the Montgomery County Council. So there, the, the, gov the government kind of writes, writes laws, creates policies, and then actually implements programs. So on the ground, my job as the IT advisor for the Montgomery County Council is to help them kind of figure out where does cybersecurity fit in all this? How does the, the fact that we now have uh, uh, iPhones that everybody's using, that expands the possibilities of cyber attacks on everyone, whether it's a county council member or whether it's a staff person or a firefighter or a policeman. So securing the ever increasing size of the, of the cyber surface, as it were, for government is very, very important. At the same time, we've tried to do things in Montgomery County to open up things, uh, open, open data laws were passed in Montgomery County in 2012 and still are in the books. So, so sometimes cybersecurity and openness uh, have a tug of war between the two. Uh, there's never a simple solution. And that's another thing from a professor viewpoint. Uh, don't look for the answer. It used to be that in physics, you did all sorts of difficult computations and you ended up with 42 is the answer. In cybersecurity, there is no 42. It's all depending on various things. The, the last thing I'll say is that internationally, uh, I've, I've done a lot of work uh, across, with Europeans, with global leaders, um, and there are some things that are of concern to me. Uh, GDPR uh, is the uh, General Data Protection Regulation that was issued by the European, uh, by EU uh, some years back, and that's beginning to hurt American competitors in American industry because they have no part in creating the law, but they're su subject to it. Uh, today, there's, there's uh, talk about a new Digital Services Act that Europe is getting ready to, to launch. And again, we can't talk to them about it because we're not part of Europe by definition. So what we need is a better collaborative platform to discuss things. And what you have here, academia, industry, and government is a very, very important triangle to work on the problems of cybersecurity. Uh, I think I've overrun my time, so Michelle, I turn the floor back to you. Thank you, Costas, and thank you for reminding us that there's this nexus uh, between uh, the different communities, and it's not just in our country, it's in every, every country. So, Laura, would you please uh, talk a little bit about yourself, your work on the Solarian Commission, and then how you view the domain? Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I'll happily pick up on that thread of, of sort of multi-stakeholder engagement because I think that's very present in how we view the domain and how, how the commission really approached its work as well. Um, so my name is Laura. I'm a think tanker by background, although right now I'm serving as one of the senior directors with the Cyberspace Solarian Commission, which is a strange little government entity right now. So I'll, I'll sort of say a little bit more about sort of where we fit in the larger ecosystem. Um, we were established in the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act. We have 14 commissioners, four of whom come to us from the Hill, including our two co-chairs. Uh, four are sitting administration officials and the other six civilians are folks out of research academia, uh, practitioners of various sorts, the private sector. Um, and this commission was tasked with finding a way to, finding a strategy to deter attacks of significant consequence against the United States in cyberspace. Um, and so when I look at what the domain is, it's very much viewed through that lens of sort of how, how you deter attacks. Uh, specifically, we were tasked to have three different task forces. One approached it from Defend Forward, the, the um, sort of DOD Cyber Command policy uh, of, of how they're deterring attacks. Um, 
Second task force looked, like, looked at deterrence by denial. You might also call that resilience. Um, and then the third task force, the one I was working with, uh, was looking at norms and international engagement. How do we work with the international community to, to really establish rules of the road that can um, decrease the incidence of attack? And of course, I, I mean, leaning on Costas's point that there are no simple answers. No, none of these three task forces sort of won the debate. Um, the, the whole organization was modeled after Eisenhower's Solarian Commission many years ago when he was looking at strategies for the Cold War. He got his three task forces together. They had a big debate. They picked a winner. Um, and we had a big debate and we said, well, you know, it's not, there's not a clear winner, actually. Uh, uh, an effective system for, for deterring attacks of significant consequence really comes from using all three of these different tools in a layered strategy. So from that, we come up with layered cyber deterrence. Um, and, you know, we, we also sort of recognize and acknowledge to the point about multi-stakeholder engagement that this is not just a federal government thing, that this really, in order to be effective, layered cyber deterrence needs to draw on stakeholders from the private sector, from civil society, from education, across the board. Um, it also can't be limited just to what you would think of the State Department and the Department of Defense discussing. It also needs to incorporate workforce development, emerging technology, research and development, all of the various aspects. So to, to your question about how do we view um, cyberspace, it's, there's, there's a lot in there and there's a lot of different ways to, to get there, but I'm really looking forward to talking through some of them. So thank you very much for having us here. Thank you, Laura. Now for our audience, the uh, privilege of the first uh, few questions goes to me, the moderator. Um, uh, thank you. I see some of you are already starting to type in your questions, please. Uh, while I get through the first couple of rounds with our panelists, start asking questions. And, and I'm hoping these introductory remarks have, have, have got your cur professional curiosity up and uh, we'll see if we can answer them. The round one, first question is, <clears throat> and we've talked already a little about this in our introductions. When you think about the international ecosystem, the internet functions through cooperation of government associations, public and private organizations, national governments, and um, <clears throat> as Dr. Matt pointed out, by necessity, national strategies discuss collaboration between governments, partnering with industry and co cooperations to get to a stable and open cyber domain. And I'd like each of you to <clears throat> discuss examples of partnerships that have been successful and where you think priority efforts should be in a collaborative form for forums. So, um, Acostas, I'll start with you. Thanks, uh, Michelle. So this is a, a really broad question, but it helps me kind of underscore a point, which is that partnerships, and I know it's kind of so often used that it becomes trite almost, partnerships is the only way we can actually find good solutions. It used to be that um, uh, people would own a problem. Today, no one owns the cybersecurity problem. No one, no, no matter how important you are. You have to work at the solution through partnerships. Now, there's a little trick here, and that is that cybersecurity in the geography domain is the globe. It is not our United States of America. It's the globe, because that's how digital electrons flow back and forth. It is the globe. It's a global thing. Now, do we have platforms on which to discuss and to collaborate the solutions that we tend to, to find out? Laura mentioned the Solarium Commission. They're, they're thinking about defending the U.S., but the U.S. is just one piece of a huge puzzle, which is called cyber a cybersecure environment for everyone. So, in order to solve it, we need some collaboration platform. And here, I have to be a little bit uh, kind of sharp and say, we don't have good ones today. When there is a cybersecurity treaty being discussed, well, you have some experts from the Department of State perhaps showing up, or maybe someone from NIST, or maybe someone, all these acronyms from the federal government. Industry sometimes participates, but usually in terms of standard setting, standards for different software and, and, and platform requirements. Uh, academia, they write papers and, and sometimes people read them, sometimes they don't. 
So what we need at international level is a stronger platform to collaborate. And I've seen some that work particularly well. About 10 years ago, there was a decision made to collaborate on creating data and data analytics for sustainability on a global scale. And that was a very difficult task, for, even for the United Nations to undertake. So a, a, a new organization was created, uh, funded by, in, in fact, the Abu Dhabi government, the environmental agency in Abu Dhabi, and inviting governments, researchers, and private industry to come together on 10 sectoral task forces to think through how to increase data availability and data analytics that can be shared across national borders. Because it was non-threatening and non-formal, there were no treaties that had to be signed, governments found it a very useful platform. I don't know if we have that in the cybersecurity domain, a non-binding, if you will, platform to discuss things, but to do so in a global level. After all, cybersecurity depends on two key words. One is collaboration and the other is trust. And we talked a little bit about how you establish trust before the webinar even started. So those are just some opening remarks. Thank you, Michelle. Happy to follow through. Thank you, Costas. Um, Laura, I think I'm gonna pick up with you next then. So perhaps in your work uh, in, in the norms, you could talk a little bit about what Costa says. Are there non-binding forms? Uh, opportunities and but the basic question is have you seen can you talk about examples of successful partnerships and where the priorities of efforts ought to be in uh forums yeah absolutely and and um perfect framing on that i think um you know we, we talked about a broad broad range of partnerships and organizations and bodies um both ones looking at more specifically norms setting um, and, and building and strengthening those. But one of, the, um, one of the areas that was particularly interesting and I think is particularly impactful, uh, Costas mentioned briefly, is standard setting bodies. So these are the multi-stakeholder bodies, the non-governmental entities, um, sometimes intergovernmental nonprofit um, bodies where uh, technologists come together to agree on sort of basic protocols for how the internet's gonna move forward. So, um, on, a, on a broad basis, you've got organizations like ICANN that deals with DNS, that deals with assignment of IP addresses, you've got IETF, deals with TC, TCP IP, you've got ITU, sort of the alphabet soup of different technologies and organizations. Um, on, for example, mobile broadband, we're hearing a lot, so the 5G debate, you're hearing a lot about um, 3GPP, all of these organizations are sort of forums where you can come together and discuss some of these things. Now, one of the interesting things is that it's not state governments. Um, it's certainly not exclusively state governments in the large majority of these uh, representing. So you're talking about both private sector entities, civil society, and a whole range of different interested partners who are taking part in these organizations. Um, but one of the challenges is, you know, the basic premise in these standard setting bodies is that the best technology should be the one we agree on as the standard, and that's the one we move forward. But how you evaluate best really depends on the um, basic values you have for the internet, right? And so in the US, we talk about having an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. Uh, but you don't necessarily see that internationally. And so figuring out how you build and bake in technologies that, um, say, for example, really uh, promote security and privacy, um, can be a challenge. And we are seeing the rise of, say, for example, data storage methods uh, for biometrics or um, access to or movement of data that, that tends towards more authoritarian aims. Um, and so uh, to, to bring it back to your question, the interesting question here is how the US government can engage with partners, can engage with partners in the private sector, civil society, researchers, uh, to really help further that vision for a uh, free, open, interoperable internet um, without politicizing these technical bodies, right? Because we don't want to march in there with, you know, uh, ranks of negotiators, ranks of government negotiators, uh, because it's not about making it the U.S. vision. It's about building a coalition of partners, be they international partners, be they corporate partners, 
um, who really share this vision for a free open internet. Um, and so we've seen, we've seen a lot of success stories with how to do that. Um, but collaborating in that sense is really nuanced and it can be pretty indirect. So I think it needs to focus particularly on those values. And it really, um, for the US, it tends to be a ground game problem. It involves really getting out there, explaining why we're making this case, that it's not about the US winning the great politics. It's about figuring out what the future of our internet is gonna look like. Um, it involves a lot of R&D. It involves a lot of making sure that the US is positioned to be the technological leader, to put forward the technologies that really provide security. Um, and one of the best things the U.S. can do to be a good partner in this space is to implement the standards that we agree to in these bodies. The best show of good faith that we are participating in these organizations, really trying to make the internet a good space, is to do at home what we advise others to do as well. So it's, you know, it's, it's a very interesting and complex and nuanced set of partnerships. Laura, thank you for that background and uh, <laughs> yeah, complicated, nuanced. I think those are words we're going to be using throughout this panel. So um, Dr. Matt, she talked about, you know, outreach to private organizations. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you feel about this? Do you, have you seen successful partnerships? Can you give us examples? And where do you think the priority is going to be? Yes, uh, absolutely. So I, I, I like the, the term nuanced partnerships, right? So you know, the, the unique thing uh, with uh, GDIT, uh, you know, being uh, the cyber director, I also uh, lead our cyber center of excellence. And um, one of the unique aspects of our cyber center of excellence is, is, is our partnerships. So, uh, and that's partnerships with academia, uh, partnerships with, uh, you know, a lot of the industry bodies, uh, as well as partnerships with a lot of the strategic, um, you know, players in technology, uh, whether that's emerging tech partners or, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the, the Microsofts, the AWSs of the world. So um, the, the challenge here is, you know, a lot of it is kind of a focused around, you know, maybe certain industry sectors or, uh, you know, certain technologies. And um, I, I mean, honestly, there's, there's so many partnership organizations out there. Um, and I, I think a lot of times it's hard to take an enterprise view. So um, the unique role that we have is you know, like, not only do we partner, uh, you know, partner for, you know, ourselves uh, to help, you know, protect our brand and reputation, you know, we're also partnering with, uh, you know, our, our government agencies to ensure that, you know, they're, they're in, you know, getting the right information uh, regards to, you know, the sectors that they're supporting. So, um, so, you know, it's, uh, I guess some examples, right? Like, you know, you have, uh, you know, global targets, you know, think of the, maybe a cloud service provider, you know, Zoom or uh, Office 365, where attackers are looking at, you know, core, you know, operational technologies that our, our agencies and global, uh, you know, companies are using. Um, or you know there are certain methods and, and technologies uh, that they're they're focusing to exploit. So you know we need to ensure that we have a hand in in understanding you know those threat sets. Um, on the from I guess the other point right is you know we have a lot of these new technologies emerging. So five G is a huge uh, aspect uh, right now, right? So you know you have leaders like uh, uh, Qualcomm, Ericsson, uh, Huawei you know, trying to push their, you know, 5G chips and, you know, architectures out. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm sure everyone has pre-ordered their iPhone uh, 12, you know, now everyone is that, you know, has a, is getting a new phone or is going to have 5G built in. So, you know, on the flip side, you know, we're going to see ISPs uh, adopting, you know, 5G acro across the board, you know, and obviously that, you know, trickles down uh, to the different uh, economies. But, um, you know, uh, the, the, the other point is, um, you know, back to these industry, you know, organizations. So like uh, you have uh, some examples like the Center for Internet Security, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, they have a very specific voice uh, and help influence uh, the policy and positions uh, around those areas. And, um, you know, just, you know, being an industry, we, we want to be a part of that and, and help drive uh, that. Um, 
you know, from a, uh, you know, we have our own, uh, you know, um, ISAC, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, information sharing analysis centers out there that we participate in, whether it's, you know, the US CERT, the, the FBI, the DIB, uh, you know, DHS. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, from a, you know, organization standpoint, you know, just the more that folks participate in those, the better that they can get, st you know, stay ahead, uh, you know, of those threats. But, um, you know, I, I, I echo Dr. Acostas where, you know, there's just, there's so much information out there with just with uh, all these disparate cyber threats that, uh, you know, just better ways, better platforms to collaborate, I, I think will help our industry uh, in general, so. So Matt, thank you for uh, those, per the perspective and, and I like, uh, thank you for bringing up 5G. We could probably have a whole separate panel on 5G, but I will tell you, I'm not getting my iPhone 12 because I'm one of the, 50 million Americans who lives in a rural area. And I don't think uh, 5G is coming to us anytime soon. So that's a whole separate issue of tech and have and have nots. Uh, so let me get to the round two question. Thank you. I see some of you are starting to populate my uh, question and answer board. But round two, uh, persistent influence campaigns sponsored by foreign governments targeting US elections rely heavily on the openness of social platforms. The government has taken steps to name and shame malicious actors. And the FBI stated in an indictment, the FBI considers any criminal activity conducted by nation state actors, especially those leading to the violation of Americans' privacy or interference in our economy to be a matter of national security. So who should take the lead in educating or training of citizens in this awareness of vulnerabilities in the cyber domain? How do we ensure public and private sector employees are on guard? And businesses today speak of corporate social responsibilities. Is there a moral or national security imperative to create a cyber savvy citizens and workforce? Uh, and so uh, once again, Costas, I'll start with you. I, I do the heavy lift all the time. Huh? Um, happy, happy to, 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 to start off the discussion. First of all, the reality is that we have no federal legislation for privacy. And, and one might argue none for security as well, legislation. And perhaps it's right that we don't because we're a very big country made of very different kinds of organizations, people, uh, environments, circumstances. But what's happening is states, state by state, are beginning to develop legislative frameworks that may or may not give the same guidance to the, those who live in those states. Uh, for example, the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, has been many times cited as like a first step to, towards privacy for everybody. And, and how, how do we approach that? And of course, uh, Michelle, you live in Colorado. How does California lawmaker know what it is that you would like to see in Colorado? So Colorado will have its own legislation and then Georgia will pipe in. So that's one end. On the other end, here comes some guy from the federal government saying, this is the way it's gonna be. So we can't have either. We have to be some kind of fractal. We have to be a fractal society that have the same kind of nurturing goals, but end up delivering them perhaps in a way that's sensitive to the, the legislative and the financial environment of each state. So if we had a legislative environment, if we had some kind of truths that everybody believed in, ensconced in law, then we could slip over into the, uh, how do we tell people what those are? Um, in, at GW, we have our, our scholarship students, uh, it's called Scholarship for Service, SFS. So we have our cyber core students go and make presentations in, elder, in homes for the elderly and talk about cybersecurity in a way that they can understand. And that happens you know, every, every semester. So in a very small way, GW is trying to make an impact on the surrounding community because we know things that they don't know. And we, we, by we, I mean our students who are, who are becoming the, the next generation of experts. So the responsibilities for all of us, but we have to make sure we know what it is that we're gonna promote. 
And there, I think we still need a national discussion and some way to approach it. And I would be an advocate for that. Uh, th those are sharp comments. Let's hope they stimulate some debate. I think that, you know, Costas, that's fascinating to me. I mean, you have all these wonderful uh, community programs where students or citizens can, you know, go work at a shelter or food bank, but, you know, community outreach as a way of education, that's, that's, that's novel. And I think uh, maybe we just need more cybersecurity nonprofits uh, to help educate America. Uh, so, uh, Laura, I'll let you pick up the question. Yeah, um, it, you know, and it's a, it's a fascinating question and a, a really hard one. Uh, on the commission, we, we really thought about this in terms of building societal resilience. How do you build a society that is resilient to information operations, resilient to disinformation, um, election meddling? Uh, and, you know, that can be really hard in a democratic environment because the U.S. government is not in the business of content moderation on private sector platforms. Uh, so our commissioners concluded that you really have to lean hard on education. And Costas, I love the idea of the scholarship for service, the, the cyber course students going out and teaching because that's, you know, that's really what it's all about. The, the, the way to solve the problem is not to take down information, but to provide information. Um, and here I have to give a hat tip as well to Suzanne Spaulding, who uh, ran the National Programs and Protectorates direct Directorate uh, at DHS, which has since become CISA. Um, who says this profoundly eloquently and far more so than I will here, but we need to be able to empower our population, not only with tools for digital, digital literacy and cybersecurity, uh, but also civics education to really have trust in our democratic institutions. Um, and so when, when we looked at this as a commission, what we really leaned on is how do we set up those sort of educational opportunities in those areas, in digital literacy, in civics education, in public awareness of cybersecurity topics. Um, and, you know, historically, we look back at things like Stop, Think, Connect, the DHS campaign really promoting cybersecurity, or it, my, my preferred somewhat further down the road, um, they did an experiment with pineapple pizza, uh, which if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I would, it's, it's worth the Google. Um, they created a divisive campaign uh, about whether or not pineapple belongs on pizza, and I have my own opinions, but I'll withhold them here. Um, but the, the, point they were demonstrating is just how easy it is with emotional content, highly emotional content, to really separate society. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for those sort of educational um, campaigns and, and efforts to really think about this. Um, so as a commission, what we recommended was finding opportunities to evaluate what's been done in the past. How do we take Stop, Think, Connect? How do we take Pineapple Pizza? How do we make them better? Um, and then how do we empower all of the stakeholders across government to bring that education to where it needs to go. Because in a federated system, the federal government doesn't govern directly what is taught in classrooms in Colorado or classrooms in Idaho or across the country. Usually it's the state government or even more likely the, the local government, the municipality, the, the um, county that's determining what goes in that content. So what the US government can really add and contribute here is putting together resources. And tying it back to the international theme of our panel, it's also worth noting that the, the federal government is a great way to plug into international wisdom, from, particularly from our partners and allies. We can be working with our 5i partners in the first instance to figure out what they're seeing on their platforms, uh, how they're handling it to share best practices. But even beyond that, with our partners and allies, this is, there's an enormous amount of learning out there and countries who have been dealing with this, frankly, for a lot longer than we have and who have come up with really good solutions. I mean, you want to talk about countering disinformation, talk to the Estonians. They've had a lot of time to think about that. Um, so I think on an international level as well, there's a lot of best practice we can be learning. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for uh, reminding us that there are some really, truly connected and cyber savvy countries out there like uh, Estonia. So uh, Dr. Matt, um, corporate social responsibility, savvy, savvy workforce, what do you think? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, in, in the cyber world, one, one of the very first things that you learn is uh, one of the greatest weaknesses is the human factor. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the challenge there is uh, like, you know, uh, you take a look at phishing or, or ransomware, um, you know, like, 
spear phishing attacks was, uh, I think, as a result of, uh, you know, 80 to 85 percent of most intrusions. Um, and, I, you know, I think the question that, you know, we should ask ourselves is, you know, does the general public, you know, have a basic understanding of cyber risk? And, um, you know, similar to, you know, from a, a corporate or, a, you know, private, pers you know, perspective, like, you know, we're, we're typically now, you know, across the board providing, you know, phishing training. Um, so, you know, I, I think we need to take a lot of those concepts, uh, you know, to the general public of just, you know, what is the cyber 101 that, you know, citizens uh, need to be aware of. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, if you look at like the election um, and influence, like DHS CISA took a, a role, you know, with partnership, you know, with Cybercom and NSA, but, you um, you know, I, I think the, the 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 training and education side. You know, I've I've been very passionate about um, you know just um, you know training a lot of uh, you know in, in a lot of government organizations. And um, you know, we have to realize that cybersecurity hasn't been around for for a long time. I mean, uh, up into the last couple of years, you know, we're now is when you're first seeing you know degrees in cybersecurity. Um, so um, I, I want to say one of the, the the easiest ways to to really drive this basic level of uh, of understanding is you know focus you know at the, at the K through twelve uh, you know domain um, you know build um, you know um, you know students that you know that have a good understanding of cybersecurity a uh, good digital ethics. Uh, they know how to be a, a good digital citizen uh, and and identify the cyber risk. And, you know, I, I think ultimately, um, you know, there's what everyone needs to understand is, uh, you know, if if we if we don't have a, a really a foundational understanding of, of cyber risk, that it ultimately hurts the economy. Um, you know, uh, all of these the phishing, ransomware, intrusion, breaches, you know, they have a severe economic uh, impact. And uh, ultimately, you know, who, who pays for that? The, the consumers. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do understand not every person can be a cyber expert. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's very valid, but, you know, back to what we were talking with industry and, um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of things that we can do to help, you know, elevate, um, you know, our, 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 you know, public, um, you know, our technologies to help have cyber baked in, uh, you know, to, to allow them to be secure. Um, so, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I, I would, would hope to across the board, and I'm sure there's a lot of lessons learned from, you know, internationally is, you know, how do we increase the, the basic level of cyber risk? Matt, thank you for that. You know, and it, it, it actually takes me back to the origin of our country. You know, uh, our founding fathers were pretty clear this whole democracy was going to work if we only had educated and literal uh, high literacy rate among our citizens. And so we may find that for this democracy to function, we're going to have to do what you're talking about. K through 12, you learn about democracy the government, and you also learn about cybersecurity. So uh, thank you, audience. You've been populating questions. I'm not going to take them in order because I've got one that's a great follow-up to the question um, I just asked. So we have um, a, a question from an audience member. There's an old adage that you're only as strong as your weakest link. The weakest link changes over time as you shore up vulnerabilities in one place others pop up. So how do you make sure you're focused on the right thing? And I, and I think for each of you in your different communities, uh, there might be a different answer. Uh, so Laura, I'm going to start with you. How, how executive government, legislative branch, how, how do we know we're focused on the right things? What a question. It's a great question um, and a really hard one. I mean, I, I can tell you when, when we as a staff for the commission first sat down a year and change ago now, a year and a half ago, um, and started looking through, you know, our, our mandate was protecting the U.S. against attacks of significant consequence in cyberspace. And even just having that laid out for us, how do we figure out what the key issues are there? And frankly, that scoping is 
really, really hard. Um, because the tendency, of course, is to, to boil the ocean, to say it's all important. Um, because it all is important. So how do, you, how do you know you're focused on the right thing? I think from the perspective of sort of looking across the whole of the US government, um, there's not one, one thing or one focus. You're dealing with a lot of different entities and a lot of different components. And what becomes the most important thing is going to be very heavily dependent on the mission of the particular organization. Um, how you pull all of that together on a coordination level, one of our uh, really big recommendations was the establishment of a national cyber director. Um, and that would be a person who would sort of who would sit in the White House in the executive office of the president and be able to establish some of that coordination. And you know, the reason I bring it up here is because I don't think that there is going to be one right focus because all of the different mission sets that US government handles are all going to be focused in slightly different places or approaching similar questions from different angles. Um, the, the strategy of doing it right is making sure that we know that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing and that they're all sort of operating according to um, reinforcing lines. So coordination. So, so thank you for that. So some of it was, a, it kind of depends on where you are, but you're, you're absolutely right. I think leveraging to exchange of information and utilizing the domain to help us figure out what the right path is. Cost us for universities and colleges, how do, how do they know what, what they're doing the right thing or have the right focus? Yes, yeah, so, uh, I'll, uh, you know, in, in a game of whack-a-mole, you know, the whack-a-mole game where you you pound down something and something else pops up. That's what the questioner uh, reminded me of. Uh, there is no winning strategy if you're just trying to pound the, the mole, because by definition, the game is set up. So if you pound one mole, the other guy will pop up. No, no question about it. So the game is rigged in a sense. You, you, can't, you can't win in whack-a-mole, right? So the, 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 the solution, the theoretical solution of universities and governments I've been thinking about for some time now uh, is to shift our attention from whacking the specific mole to reducing the, the damage that the moles are doing. Okay, so in, in for example, in the disaster uh, preparedness uh, domain, we, we talk about shifting from hazard uh, 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 approach to risk reduction. Hazard means there's a hazard, you gotta do something about it. Or there was a disaster, you gotta respond to it. The more uh, enlightened process says, no, 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 you have to stop doing that. You have to stop responding your way out of disasters. You have to start identifying the risk and then managing a risk reduction strategy. So in a sense, I'm telling the questioner, it's their own question. We should not be pounding moles. We should not be looking for the weakest link. We should be looking at the system and we should be exercising a risk reduction strategy. Now, there may be links that we should pay attention to, but we cannot pay attention simply to the weakest link, but we have to manage a risk reduction strategy once we define the system. And Laura has already spoken to how difficult it is to define the system. Those are just some thoughts. Thank you. And uh, Matt, what do you think? Sure. So, you know, I, I think it's all about cyber prioritization. So, you know, it, all of this costs uh, time and money, but realistically, you know, there's a threat, there's a likelihood of an exposure, uh, and there's an impact. So, um, the unfortunate thing is, you know, cyber is kind of that zero sum investment, right? You know, you know, you can invest a dollar or a million dollars and, you know, you're, you're not necessarily getting a return on that. So uh, until a, a big breach happens, uh, you know, typically, you know, you're not necessarily seeing that significant investment. And, um, you know, what, what we understand is, you know, when a, when a huge breach happens, um, you know, it, it hurts brand, it hurts the brand, it hurts the reputation, it hurts revenue. Uh, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, companies are beginning to understand that. So, um, I, I think there's a lot of lessons learned, uh, especially right now uh, in government. Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily, um, you know, what, what your score is, but uh, what measurable progress that you're making, right, towards the risk. 
uh, towards those risks. So um, in, in the federal space, you know, they've, they've established essentially, uh, you know, cyber scorecards. Uh, so in, you know, within the DOD, um, you know, we have the continuous diagnostic and mitigation program um, where, you know, all the federal agencies are kind of reporting their progress um, and, you know, their cyber maturity. Uh, the most unique thing that's happening right now uh, with the defense industrial base is um, essentially deploying the, the, the DOD cyber maturity model, uh, which, you know, defines the level of maturity of the organization from their cyber posture. Um, and uh, if, uh, if you've been paying attention, uh, the NIST uh, released their cybersecurity framework, which, uh, you know, private companies can actually use to kind of benchmark, uh, you know, their cyber um, you know, posture. So I, I think really, you know, it's, it's all about driving cyber resilience. Um, but, you know, how do you measure that? Uh, and, you know, how do we reduce those risks? But we really have to prioritize, you know, what are the most significant risks, you know, to the organization, mission, uh, et cetera. So um, I, I, I would foresee probably in the next five to 10 years, um, you know, that those cyber maturity models extending more into the private sector. No, and, and I, I think you hit one of even when you're trying to do the assessment, okay, I've picked my path, I've picked my priorities. Now, how, how do I get the information and am I gathering the right information to say, yep, that validates the path I picked. Um, Winston Churchill, no matter how beautiful the strategy, sometimes you got to look at the results. And so now uh, I'm going to uh, pick up another question from one of our audience members. And uh, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at answering this first one seems that it's actually maybe more at the moderator than uh, than the communities you're in. Uh, all all on the subject of cybersecurity. I am a recent graduate from the University of Edinburgh, whose dissertation's official title is Cyber Warfare and its Determinant. And I thought it would be interesting to hear your views and your opinion under what circumstances can cyber warfare be justified? So as someone who's actually uh, been in combat, uh, I would say, I would like to parse this out just, just a little. Well, there are different types of warfare. Uh, naval warfare, tank warfare, and I think in terms of the law of armed conflict, cyber, cyber warfare is just another type of warfare. And so when you separate out the methodology from the actual declaration of war or, or conducting warfare, the law of armed conflict has been around for centuries. And what a nation needs to do to, to justify war um, is laid out. And everyone who's, who's a member of the UN, which is most of the nations of the world, have agreed to what justifies warfare. And, and basically, uh, generally, you've been attacked or your sovereign or political independence um, has been threatened. So I would, I would not worry about the means so much but understand that nations have a responsibility um, to be justified. Uh, and the way the charters of the world are set up and the way of the law of armed conflict, so you have to have just cause if you're gonna go to war. And I would also separate that out from military operations. There are naval operations, land operations, uh, air operations, space operations that happen all the time. That does not mean we're engaged in warfare. And of course, most uh, nations around the world now conduct cyber operations, but that does not mean you're engaged in warfare. For the Department of Defense for the United States, 2015, uh, in the Law of Armed Conflict Guide, uh, the General Counsel and the legal minds of all the services came to a conclusion as to what is cyber operations, and then when cyber operations cross that threshold for use of force. So for us, legally, it's, it's very clearly defined as to what cyber operations are, uh, and then when that threshold is crossed, that you would actually go into war. But in this country, 
it's only one person who gets to, to declare war. Uh, the competent authority is the president. So uh, might be, maybe from an ethics standpoint, Costas, there might be a perspective. Um, Matt, I don't know if there's a industry perspective, but perhaps a government perspective, if any of you would like to chime in or I can go to the next question. I just wanted to endorse what you said, Michelle, but also to give a shout out to a, a prior a CISPRI a fellow, a Trey Herr, who's now at the Atlantic Council. He's written an excellent, edited an excellent book called Cyber Insecurity, Navigating the Perils of the Next Information Age. Trey has been looking in his doctoral dissertation was on the same topic at cyber war, defining and de describing and, and kind of creating a structure for how to think about war uh, uh, in, in modern terms. Uh, so for those of you that are uh, uh, research oriented, uh, uh, check out Cyber Insecurity, the book uh, edited by uh, Trey Hur, a good friend. Yeah, so uh, I, I think just to chime in here, um, you know, I, I see space as a, as a huge example of, of this concept, right? So, you know, we're, we're have you know, we're launching these satellites into space, you know, we established, you know, elevated, you know, US, uh, you know, Space Force as a, uh, you know, as a, as a as a, its own entity, uh, you know, we have private companies now, like uh, you know, Star, um, you know, Starlink, you know, creating these, you know, m private microsats all around. And um, you know, how do you attack and defend? Um, you know, it's it's all cyber. <laughs> Um, the, the biggest challenge I, I think that we have now is, um, you know, in, in these kind of warfare instances is, is attribution. So, you know, back to, you know, cybersecurity has no borders. Um, anyone can go out and, and tack something. How do we know for a fact and validate that, you know, this entity, uh, you know, attacked, you know, this asset? Um, and, and that's a real challenge, uh, you know, across the board. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of times, you know, we, we, we tread lightly in this space because of the, you know, the implications of, of that. So um, it, it's interesting to see, I, I think, where, where, where that will be headed. It's the analogy of thinking through, I, I, I'm, still, I'm still caught in your analogy of space as a way to think through this. That's, that's a good way to look at it and an interesting one. Um, in terms of attribution, I would also break out, you know, there's, there are two two parts of this here. One is the technical challenge of attribution and still challenging, but I think we've gotten a lot better. What was true five, 10 years ago is not necessarily still true today in terms of the difficulty of attribution. Uh, what remains extremely difficult is the political side of attribution. Uh, when do we choose to go public with what we know, given not only um, the challenge of burning assets, but um, figuring out how we do so in a credible way. And I think this is where we come back to working with partners and allies abroad. You've seen an increased number of joint attributions um, with not just our standard partners, but increasingly large um, groups of countries who are all willing to stand up and say, no, this was a violation of what we think appropriate responsible state behavior is. Um, and I think that that really, um, you know, your, your original question was, under what circumstances can cyber war be justified? We do have strong legal frameworks for this, um, for activities that are below the threshold of armed combat, armed, armed conflict. I think you've got, um, you know, increasing steps like that that are helping sort of hash out the normative space of what that looks like. Uh, you also have um, organizations like the UN Group of Government Experts that are that are establishing norms for that space as well. Thank you, Laura. So I think we've got, uh, I think our first, our, 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 our audience is into the national security aspect of, of this domain. So the next question is, to what extent does the lack of visibility of cyber weapon development, as opposed to say development of nuclear weapons, increase tensions between adversarial countries? Uh, I find the question interesting because obviously, nuclear weapons also were originally developed in secret. Uh, so I think it's that sort of, somebody ought to write a book on the development of weapons. Generally, if you've got the, the keys to the kingdom, you're developing them in a classified manner. And then it's not until uh, it's, it's out of Pandora's box that you start to have more visibility. But I, that's an interesting question. How does the lack of visibility of cyber weapon development increased tension between adversarial countries 
Uh, does anyone want to take that on? I'm more than more than happy to dive in, although I'm interested to hear what everybody else on the panel thinks as well. Um, you know, when I first started my sojourn into Washington, um, as an intern at the State Department, I was working with the Office of Multilateral Nuclear and Security Affairs. And a big part of what they do there is um, essentially confidence building measures on nuclear affairs. Uh, and, and there is a, an incredibly complex and mature system for exactly as you said, ma'am, um, establishing what, what our nuclear capacities are, what the international community has agreed to, making sure we're complying to that. Um, and I think that, you know, we don't have, obviously we don't have that level of maturity in cybersecurity, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not a goal that we should be working towards. I think, you know, the, the way we really control the escalatory potential that you're pointing to, and it is a very real potential, I think, um, but the way we, the way we control that is through confidence building measures, figuring out how we work with not just partners and allies, but adversary governments to, you know, have direct lines of communication in the case of emergencies, to have incident response teams who, who um, know and can communicate with one another. Uh, and, and that's how we start to build some of that transparency. Thank you, Laura. I, thanks for bringing up the confidence building measures. And I know OSCE has, has started down that path several years ago. Um, uh, Matt or Costas, uh, any thoughts or do you want me to go to the next question? Yeah, I, I think just, you know, I, I think that question uh, just echoes, you know, I think all the all the the nations and, you know, the U.S., I mean, they, they see this as a priority, you know, war fighting domain. So, and, you know, just, you know, if we look at the, the investments, I mean, you know, it's where, you know, you're seeing that I, I think you know, there's a unique perspective there where, you know, I think the, the cyber domain brings a, a unique set of capabilities. And, you know, I, I think globally, you know, countries, you know, value that. Oh. Sorry, I lost, <laughs> I lost my screen for a second. Oh, I hope I wasn't hacked. So thank you, thank, thank you. Um, and then uh, Costas, uh, any any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I just, I'm gonna say again, something irreverent perhaps, but I think it's time to reconsider the international platforms we, we have for century, half a century or more, the UN system and so on, and try to bring them up to the current level. Um, uh, we're, we're working with the speed of light but we're moving in international discussions with the speed of, you know, you pick your animal of choice, you know, a snake or a, a turtle. We, we need new um, uh, organizational platforms because in my mind and having worked within them at the fringes for sure, they're not responding to today's world. The United Nations was created in the 40s, for, you know, I mean, think about it, in the 40s. That's 80 years ago. Surely the, the environment in which you create a platform for nations to come together has to reflect in the, in the, in the platform you create. And I think it's time to rethink that. Certainly not for me to rethink that, but that would be my wish that folks would be brave enough not to try to fix current systems, but to create new ones, because the, the, the world outside isn't getting any simpler. It's getting more and more uh, um, uh, challenging, and the speed with which it gets challenging is cyber speed. We don't have a cyber UN. We have an analog UN. So we need the equivalent of a cyber UN, and I don't know what that looks like, but I know it doesn't look like today's UN. So, Costas, <clears throat> that is actually a great segue into the next question uh, from one of my former students. So I won't say your name, but glad to see you're listening in. Um, and a, a perspective on the UN is, I, I think when you look at the charter and then you look at the uh, rights of mankind, I, I, I think there's a lot there that the language was written expansively enough that we can create um, uh, content, 
uh, and agreements within the within the UN framework, but some people feel it's it's too divisive. So that leads to this next question: Is it creating new fora, or is it this question? Could multilateral institutions on a regional level, such as the European Union or Organization of American States, serve as the initial platforms for larger scale discussion between states, the cybersecurity industry, and academia? Acostas, I kind of think you're on the know, but what do you think about the question? Again, you know, I, 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 I call for a kind of a fractal approach. It's the beginning of a fractal approach. I would definitely think that if we had all the world covered, because, you know, we have to remember, you know, EU, OAS, they've been established, they've got a history, they got the framework, they got infrastructure to build on. The, the equivalent in Africa is, is, has, has been there for, for some decades, but it's weak. It's not supported strongly by its member states. Um, uh, Asia, there's, there's, there's conflicting platforms. So the, the challenges and the de detail of who, who those regional platforms would be, but I think it's an excellent way to begin to address things with the granularity that you need for the cybersecurity of the future, whether it's privacy or security, you do need to go down to the regional level before you emerge into a global, thou shalt do this, or here's our recommendation. So I think uh, uh, Jacob who put that question up. I, uh, uh, I say yes, yes indeed. And I, I wouldn't be surprised to know that uh, there are some beginning strands. The EU, for example, has already started a huge uh, um, uh, kind of vision for what the cyber world would look like, not just security. You know, they're now going into the whole economic activity and how cyber drives that. I think they're onto something and they do have a framework uh, that can work. So, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with that question. Laura, what do you think? Uh, are some of the standing uh, forum, international forum, or regionals, or is that a good entree point? So I think regional fora can definitely be incredibly valuable. I think that we are seeing um, sort of regional collaborative work around building some of those confidence uh, building measures that we were talking about earlier. Um, I think that regional fora can also be incredibly valuable for uh, capacity building, for helping other member states sort of bring up their baseline level of cybersecurity. Um, you know, I am, I'm perhaps, I, 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 I I'm chewing through everything that Costas has said because I, 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 to take your opinion and give every bit of it serious credence. Um, but I also want to sort of put in an opinion that we should hesitate to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and recognizing we have some international participants, I'll, I'll translate the idiom, which is to say that we should be careful not to throw out a good idea simply because it's not working the way we want it to. Uh, I think, and a lot of our work on the commission reflects that reinforcing the systems that we already have, so reinforcing things like the 2015 UN Group of Governmental Experts Agreement on Norms, it is a really valuable exercise. Um, you know, and part of the reason for saying that is that uh, I, I hesitate to provide opportunities to relitigate some of the sort of foundational premises on which our, our understanding of norms are built, right? Um, we have a, a pretty basic framework of what cybersecurity is, which is to say that it does include um, the being able to trust in the, the confidence, the integrity, the availability of data. We, we choose to believe that it really doesn't include constraining the flow of information, right? Facts that are contrary to what the government says are not dangerous as such. We don't want to constrain that in our understanding of cybersecurity in, in sort of the security of the information space. And so when we start talking about establishing new bodies and new entities entirely, um, I, I think that we want to avoid a relitigation where we start to open the door to some of those conversations. Um, not to say that, you know, the, what the multi-stakeholder conversations reflect should reflect the opinions of those stakeholders. However, I also think that we need to understand that we've built good work uh, and reinforcing that work so that it works the way we need it to. Is, is a valuable enterprise. I accept the friendly amendment. <laughs> Thank you, Gustus. You know, Matt, I mean, we're talking a lot of corporations, they're global, they're huge. 
And so they are, they deal with these organizations uh, in the, you know, business regulation or uh, particularly, I mean, lately EU and cybersecurity. What do you think? Is there a place for partnership for the corporate world to get it in at the regional level and start shaping a more stable internet? What do you yeah. think? So, so absolutely. I, I think regionally is, is the best way to uh, execute and operationalize uh, some of these kind of key concepts. So, you know, I, I, I kind of think back to the, this concept of, you know, in cybersecurity, we have the concept of like uh, left of boom, left of breach or right of breach, right, right of boom, right? So, so typically you have this catastrophic cyber event and, you know, that that's a, has a cause and effect of, you know, adopting this standard or this technology, right? And, um, you know, we've seen that kind of regionally. I mean, we, we've mentioned Estonia, you know, quite, quite a few times. Um, and I think one of the, the best ways to, to really, um, you know, focus our, our, our partnerships is, you know, we, we talk standards, right? You know, th there has to be some type of, of standard. So um, some examples of that is uh, with, uh, you know, the Internet Engineering Task Force that, you know, we realized we needed to implement DNSSEC across the board. Um, so, you know, I think if we have the right standards, um, you know, we, we, that, that allows us to ensure globally that, you know, this is being met. But, you know, I think on a regional level, um, it makes us easy to adopt. We, we all know, you know, day one, you know, we're not going to have, you know, this de facto consensus, right? So how can we, you know, incentivize, uh, you know, companies, organizations, um, you know, countries to, to go about adopting, you know, this cyber standard. So, um, I, I think driving a, a, a standard, uh, incentivizing that, um, and, you know, using the, the, the private sector to help adopt a lot of these things, uh, you know, I, I think is important. Uh, I mean, we've, we've seen in the news recently uh, with, uh, you know, quite a few issues with, uh, you know, certain companies, uh, like a good example, like TikTok, uh, where, you know, there's a lot of privacy issues, you know, dealing with uh, some of the data that they're collecting. So, you know, if we have that standard uh, for, you know, companies to abide by, um, I, I think it's, it's helpful. Uh, thank you, Matt. Yeah, <clears throat> this is definitely an ecosystem and the uh, private world has a, a role to place, uh, play and, and and you know perhaps a responsibility to help shape it for the better of all all people of the world. <clears throat> so talking of people of the world, uh, next question. It's uh, it's established that women are disproportionately affected by conflict and international security, including gender-based violence online. And not the questioner's uh, point, but I would also add when you look at things like sex trafficking around the world. Uh, definitely uh, a challenge uh, in this domain and how the information is used. So how will the future of international cybersecurity mitigate this gap and ensure cybersecurity policy recognizes women and its creation? Costas, I'm gonna let you have your lift again and start with you. Uh, I'd love to do that. Uh, a fair warning, I'm on the board of directors of an organization called Women in Cybersecurity. Um, and I can tell you that uh, one of the best ways to make sure laws are written the right way is to make sure women are writing the laws. Um, so therefore, we need more women in the workplace, in the cybersecurity work, workspace, be they legislators, be they technicians, be they uh, management people. So how to get more women in, into cybersecurity jobs becomes huge. Um, and uh, I can tell you, I'm, I've also launched about 10 years ago, something called the National Cyber League, uh, which is a competition fall and spring for young men and women in high school and, and, uh, and college uh, grades. And we started with about 15% participation of women. We're now you know, approaching the 30s. Uh, still not good enough, but the, 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 the notion, and I think Matt uh, started off with that, get, get them early, get them in the K through 12, and then give them the tools of the trade is one of the best ways 
to, to equalize things. I'm not a believer that you write a law and then it happens. You have to actually make it happen and you make it happen through participation, active participation, and you also make it happen by having women in the right places to make, make things work. That's my un unenthusiastic response. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Laura, yeah, go ahead. Emphatically agree. Um, and I know Costas has been an incredible ally to women in this space for a long time and, and I think said, said that all very well. Um, you know, I think when we talk about diversity and inclusion in cybersecurity, I tend to give, because everybody needs the, the business case for why this matters, and there is a business case, um, I, I tend to give three reasons for this. One, we need people too badly in the cybersecurity workforce to be systemically overlooking any groups of people, uh, whether they're rural populations who didn't have access to the technology to get online to learn the things to begin with, or whether they are women who were never really brought up in the same video gaming, hacking, whatever culture, or people who didn't have opportunities to access the educational tools that they needed because they didn't have the affluent school districts that allowed it. Whatever the reason is, if we have systemic barriers that are preventing us from accessing talent, we need to figure them out and fix them um, because we just need people too badly. Second is that diverse teams address problems better. And I'm going to come back to this one. Um, third thing is it's simply the right thing to do. Uh, people should be included in these jobs and the workforce should reflect the populations it represents internationally, domestically, across the board. Um, but I want to return to that second point that um, really we can more effectively address international security issues or domestic security issues with diverse teams because the questions that we ask about cybersecurity reflect the people who are asking them. Um, and having diverse teams means that we have people who are in a position to say, okay, well, what's the bearing of this uh, for women online? What's the bearing on this for, for women in conflict zones? Um, and making sure that there are people who have the personal background and experience to know what those questions are is one of the best steps we can take to make sure we're addressing them safely and smartly. Thank you, Laura. Um, Matt, I mean, gap in uh, uh, gender in the, in the tech world is uh, pretty well known and, and, and God, God bless them, everything I see, there's not a tech company that isn't talking about it and trying to address it. So Costas is <clears throat> positioning, you gotta, you gotta have women in there to get that perspective in there. Well, what do you think is, is that's true or, and is there something beyond just getting women into cybersecurity to make sure that they're taken care of in societal conflict situations. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about uh, this because um, you know we we have a pretty extensive commitment to advancing uh, you know diversity, equality, and inclusion you know across GDIT. So uh, you know in, in cyber, I mean, we understand we need every person. Uh, every capability that we can get to, to solve the cyber challenges of this nation. So uh, having those diverse perspectives, voices, ideas, I mean, ultimately that allows us to be stronger and have a, uh, you know, a stronger set of tools to, to apply to that challenge. Um, most recently, uh, actually last week, uh, we had our Women in Technology event um, where we, we, uh, we had some very focused uh, zero trust cyber panels uh, with a lot of our, our leading uh, women cyber professionals, uh, you know, with uh, GDIT, which uh, I think is uh, pretty awesome. Um, you know, we're very committed to, to developing our uh, cyber workforce. Uh, we're actually, uh, you know, driving forward our cyber workforce development plan. Um, and, you know, just speaking of diversity, you know, we have a lot of employee resource groups, um, you know, across uh, technology. So, you know, I mean, we recognize that, um, you know, I think it was 26% uh, of, of, of women made up the professional computing position. So, you know, we're committed, you know, as an organization to drive that number up as, as much as possible. So, um, and I think that's important for, for every, every company and organization out there to do as well. Can I have seconds? Just, just, very, just very quickly, because we have a large audience of GW students. I also wanted to give out uh, a shout out to Shelley Heller, Professor Shelley Heller, 
who runs the Center for Women in Engineering. Uh, so all, all those of you who might be in engineering or not non engineering and would like to consider careers in engineering and are women, uh, please consider uh, uh, knocking up on the steps of uh, uh, Center for Women in Engineering at GW or Shelly Heller or the Deputy Director Tally Walsh, and I'm sure they're going to fire you up. I just want to be practical and, and also end with the following. The reason why we need more women in cybersecurity is because it pays well, period. The, the financial argument is all you need to say. Cybersecurity is one of the best pay paying jobs right now with the longest trajectory of continuing to, to, to look for women, for, for cybersecurity experts. So therefore, it is in, in, incumbent on us to open up that uh, uh, pathway to women because it pays well, period. End of argument. We don't have to make any other philosophical arguments. Thank you. And Costas, thanks for reminding us that economic empowerment is also a path to normalization of roles, uh, equal, equal opportunity and uh, for citizens across different, different nations. <clears throat> Matt, I wanted to, to applaud uh, GD's efforts uh, on Women in Tech. Thank you for, <clears throat> for sharing, us, uh, sharing with us that, uh, what your company's been doing. And then just finally for me, uh, I do want to say that in terms of societies and conflict, uh, women, peace, and security, there's also another perspective. It's leveraging uh, the cyber domain to get after these issues, this, this uh, women and, and children as, as uh, disproportionate victims of violence. And uh, over my time in the military, uh, I have been delighted to see the number of nonprofits that are on the ground. Uh, and, and I mean, a lot of countries are pretty wired. They, they skip the whole landlock part of the development. The number, the number of, of humanitarian assistance groups that use apps now uh, to help uh, connect uh, people who are in trouble in a, in a, in a disaster, in a conflict, to get them connected, to get, get to the right place or to get food or water to them. Uh, and so we can leverage this technology uh, in a lot of places, people will have a cell phone and, and uh, around the world and they're doing their, everything's done off that, off that phone from banking, but we can also help uh, make sure people are taken care of in conflict, leveraging this technology and making sure there's a gender perspective in the development of apps to get after this issue. Uh, and so I think we have time for one more question and, and, and we have enough questions to go on for the rest of the day. Well, I'm going to ask this last question, but just want to make sure everyone is aware. Uh, the panelists have uh, committed to try, uh, we're capturing all your questions, and uh, afterwards they'll work their way through them and make sure we get responses back to you. <clears throat> last question. A lot of the cyber threat today is from criminal organizations. Many of these are either tacitly or actively supported by nation states. How can we dissuade this behavior and encourage better international cooperation in cyber law enforcement? Laura, I think I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it was my pleasure over the course of the commission to work for uh, a detailee out of the FBI, out of FBI cyber. Um, and that for me provided a really interesting window into some of that international law enforcement collaboration. Um, the, the systems that are set up to really enable us to work well with our partners and allies on law enforcement issues are, are impressive, but they're under-resourced. Uh, so to give one example, um, we have a system of assistant legal uh, attaches focused specifically on cybersecurity. Um, there's, oh gosh, off the top of my head, I think about a dozen, maybe fewer, spread across the world. These are people who are, you know, um, uh, American law enforcement folks who are then sent abroad to go help our partner, partners and allies um, with their own law enforcement and figure out how to navigate the United States system. So when a lot of the um, criminal cases tie back to data or traffic that crosses US networks because some of the big platforms providers, email providers, different, different um, companies are based in the United States, they need to figure out how to navigate the US legal bureaucracy in, in order to access uh, the data they need to pursue their case. 
Um, so American law enforcement, our, our folks are out there sort of providing some of that connectivity. Uh, we're also working on a system of mutual legal assistance treaties, MLATs, um, to make that easier. There's, uh, we're working on negotiating the, the Cloud Act you may have heard of is, is another effort to sort of create some, some sort of pathways for communication on international law enforcement collaboration. Um, all of these things are slow and really could use some serious dedicated focus on how we might make the MLATs move faster, how you make some of these requests for information move, move more quickly so we can be helping our partners and allies and all governments uh, figure out how to pursue cybercrime or whatever criminal case they're looking at uh, in a way that's compliant with US legal regimes. Um, we need to be figuring out how our assistant legal attaches for cyber can, can really be engaging with a broader array of countries because it benefits the US too, to be able to have boots on the ground to understand what sort of criminal activity different countries are seeing. Um, beyond that, on an international level, uh, the Budapest Convention is, is sort of the international agreement that governs quite a lot of how international law enforcement collaboration works and, and, and how, how that operates. Um, reinforcing some of the systems and collaboration set up there is, is really a, a critical part of making sure that internationally we are addressing criminal threats as effectively as possible. Wow, <clears throat> Laura, thank you for that rundown. And, um, and, and I appreciate the assessment that, you know, this is a, uh, I think you used the word under-resourced but capable and, uh, you know, so that's an area uh, I think we could all focus on. And then Costas, I mean, not under your .gov hat, but under your .edu hat, is there something academia can help with cyber criminals? I mean, potentially every student could be a victim. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, GW has had uh, programs in forensics and, uh, and other disciplines which really cut across any national boundary, <clears throat> even our cybersecurity degrees, of course, uh, cut across so, or any national boundary. So training for, um, for um, uh, legal uh, areas um, allow us to have students from, let's say, the law school of GW come to the School of Engineering and get an engineering kind of um, 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 swipe on top of their law expertise. The bottom line for me, though, Michelle, is that I hope someday we stop talking about cyber criminals and we talk about criminals, period. Cyber is part of the, of the problem. And by separating it out, it may be good in our nascent state of affairs. But soon, I would hope we strengthen our legal environment and implementation of law of, of the United States and other countries that doesn't have to do with cyber, it has to do with legal implementation, legal uh, application of law. That would make it easier for our Congress to put more money in it. Thank you, Costas, taking us into the future. So Matt, I'll, I'll finish with you. You know, and the question really gets at the, <clears throat> the Sony breach, right? <clears throat> it's a private corporation, uh, <clears throat> intellectual property theft, exploitation of their emails, but in the end, it was a nation state actor. This has got to be very challenging for corporations. You're, 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 you just want to do business and now you're in the international arena and caught up in international politics. What do you think? Yeah, so I, I think a couple, couple things to dissect there, right? So, you know, luck, I mean, luckily, but unluckily, you know, that, that's one that is, you know, very public and, and out there. But I think, unfortunately, you know, there's there's a lot of cyber events that you know aren't out there, and um, I, I think that the challenge that a lot of companies face is, you know, if if we publish that out there, you know, that's uh, that's you know really risks our reputation, you know, our brand, and and unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I feel like um, you know a lot of organizations are hesitant to to kind of report that out there. Um, you know, I think back to the collaboration piece, um, you know, th there's a lot of, uh, you know, ISACs and partnerships uh, such as like the DIB where there's avenues to report uh, those cyber events um, and, and, and those kind of indicators. So 
Uh, I think back to the, the solution to this is we have to quantify the cyber risk. Um, so if, if we're not reporting and we don't know those adversaries are you know, attacking our networks, it, it's very hard to justify those resources uh, you know, to help respond you know, to those challenges. So um, I think ultimately we, we need to do a better job with, you know, of having you know, these private companies report their cyber events, their threats, uh, and share that data. Um, and, you know, I think we've, we've seen a lot of transformation around that, uh, similar to what we've seen with the transformation uh, in the federal side with, you know, establishing vulnerability disclosure uh, uh, policies. So, you know, I think the, the more that we share information, we share those risks, um, the easier it is to kind of resource. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, it could come down to sanctions. Uh, I think uh, the more that we can engage in sanctions uh, at an economic level, that it helps governments prioritize, you know, going after and not necessarily turning a blind eye to some of the, you know, the, the, the cyber organizations that are operating, you know, within their borders. Thank, thank you, Matt, and a great way to end this panel. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about collaboration amongst different communities, uh, particularly governments and, and private enterprise, academia. And <clears throat> so I need to thank each of you, uh, Dr. Matthew McFadden, Costas, Dr. Kutak Costas-Torregas, and Ms. Ms. Laura Bate for giving us so much of your time today and, and taking us uh, into a rich discussion on the challenges in this domain and the intersectionality of all of, of life and the different organizations and communities. And so for our audience, <clears throat> we will work to answer your questions if we weren't able to get to them live today. I wanna thank you uh, for joining us and, um, and continuing your education process, whether you're in government or academia or or industry. Uh, and so thank you and thank you to our panelists.